Okay, we are live. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Protocol Town Hall, a guest talk series every two weeks focused on protocols and protocol research. Today, we're talking with Rafael Fernandez about his research project for the Summer Protocols cohort entitled The Swarm and the Formation, which will be released in Module 4 of the Protocol Kit. Uh, this will be our final town hall of the year, and a schedule for the next year will be out soon at summerofprotocols.com. Uh, with that, I will hand it off to Venkat to introduce our speaker today. All right. Welcome, everybody, and uh, really pleased to introduce uh, Rafa for today's town hall. Uh, I think I first uh, met Rafa when we were hanging out together in the Yak Collective. And at that point, I believe he was uh, still just exploring uh, the crypto world and getting into protocols and things. And then he ended up at Mirror um, doing a lot of community development for them. And um, I guess uh, got blooded in the first uh, or in the previous crypto boom. And since then, he's been... Uh, uh, running this really interesting uh, group called Folklore, which uh, is kind of like a community curation, swarm-based uh, collective intelligence entity or thing uh, that I'm not quite sure I understand, but it works off some souped up version of Telegram and apparently um, delivers interesting uh, news and reading to people. And I believe also uh, Folklore is starting to like uh, sponsor people to write articles. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Rafa. But yeah, so it was um, really great to have him in the summer program to kind of like put, uh, uh, I don't know, more theoretical um, frameworks and I don't know, deeper reflection behind what he was kind of doing in practice. And I think it worked because this project, the swarm and the formation came out of it. And it, um, I don't know, led to lots of very interesting discussions through the summer, including, uh, if I recall correctly, one guest talk by an entomologist talking about actual insect swarms. So lots of fun stuff around this uh, project. So over to you, Rafa, on swarms. Thank you, Venkat. Um, so I think uh, that it has been a really interesting journey from, from the beginning, and uh, we'll kind of get into it. Um, yes, I, I work at Folklore. Folklore is kind of like a decentralized like curation um, environment that, again, is, is very swarm-like. And I'm very grateful to have been able to spend uh, the majority of the summer thinking about swarms and thinking specifically how they differ from like crowds and, and animals and such. Um, now, I'll preface this that the initial idea was to figure out what protocols actually shape swarms. And the, the main insight that I think that came out of it was actually not what protocols define it. It's actually the absence of protocols that can actually define something as well. Um, and that negative space, I think that concept of thinking, not just of what protocols are used, but also what happens when there are no protocols or when protocols are not used uh, are very interesting uh, research finds. Um, so that, without further ado, uh, we'll jump into the presentation. Um, so I grew up in Puerto Rico and um, the a, a long while back, back in 1998, um, I experienced my first hurricane. I was very young and I thought it was very exciting. I didn't really understand the implications of it. Um, but about 20 years later, um, a really, really catastrophic hurricane actually hit Puerto Rico. And uh, one of the things, the sky turns lilac. Uh, it's, it's really scary, but it's not just only scary because it's like high winds, but it's actually just because of the amount of damage um, that actually occurred on the island. This was a really defining moment for, for Puerto Rico. And um, the official death count was actually 64, uh, but uh, that was initially. Uh, what we found out later was that uh, there was a blackout for like over three months. It was really absolutely terrible. And the the actual death count, death count that came out afterwards was over 4,000. And this number kind of got ingrained inside the, the minds of the people who were participating. Now, what's what's kind of fascinating is that um, the hurricane was not the, the, the one thing that was necessarily summoned in this environment, 
Um, but actually, uh, while I was living in London, a friend of mine here, uh, Jorge, was in Berlin, and something really interesting happened, which is using Facebook and social media, uh, people started coordinating organically um, to be able to provide uh, uh, mutual aid it, uh, and address this climate catastrophe. Um, and this is really important because the reason why this happened too was that a lot of for a lot of protocols had been forgotten on the island themselves on how to deal with a climate catastrophe. The last hurricane that had actually happened on the island um, that was this bad was almost 100 years ago. Uh, so the population had forgotten, like our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, and before who had experienced really catastrophic environments had forgotten all the specific ties and protocols to deal with this type of situation. And so on Facebook, people started creating uh, new ways to kind of coordinate. So lack of protocols in Puerto Rico meant that um, we still needed to react. So people around the world, that diaspora, began sharing in, information about what could be done. And they solidified through the usage of memes and through uh, specific channels of communication into uh, it, like transforming this anxiety into a, a type of support and had this kind of like emergent promise that we'll talk a little bit about later that said, okay, let's not delay this. Let's let, let we need to get supplies to our friends and family uh, because they're actually like suffering on the island and we need to, we need to help. And this type of formation, which didn't have an organizing institution, didn't have managerial roles, didn't have uh, enterprise resource planning software, didn't have um, prioritization criteria or evaluation criteria on what to do, is exactly this concept of an online swarm. Um, Jorge had created a spreadsheet that had mutual uh, a drop-off points. Uh, Pablo, which um, they met online, had mobilized a team to address like delivery logistics from New York. Um, and just like them, their team and kind of like this like cell environment, um, a lot of other teams actually did the same thing at the same time and ended up with this like civilian supply chain of, uh, of funds. Um, now, this is this is not the, the, the only kind of like environment here, like the digital diaspora had kind of mobilized into a swarm, which we can characterize as a network of people, content and bots that were continuously aligned through uh, Facebook's and social media's governing feeds through the ecosystem themselves. When we look at a swarm of ants and we look at the bridges that they're showing, they're not just showing us how they're organizing, they're actually looking at the, they're presenting to us the terrain which they're navigating. And so the swarm of people in Puerto Rico were very much showing us the digital terrain that they were navigating to be able to get mutual aid uh, to the island. And this was not related to the to the the, um, the the protocols which existed, but because of the lack of protocols, then you just navigate whatever terrain you have available. Your terrain, in many ways, becomes your protocol. Um, this this pattern that we see in ants here, this is army ants building a bridge and being able to cross between one leaf to another. Um, they is very similar, but for swarms, you're navigating network worlds, so digital environments. Um, and the hurricane response is kind of building bridges, but they're building bridges of information and data um, that enable a supply chain of aid. Um, this is this image here, you might think, oh, swarms are like crowds or digital crowds. Um, now crowds, um, uh, this one is depicted here. This is a blueprint. Uh, you can see the little X's here where people are gathering and this is a plaza. Um, so this is a little bit similar. Participants gather organically and act as a collective too. Um, and we can even picture a crowd gathering at a sunny spot. And you might think uh, from an outside, oh, everybody talked about sitting in that position when in reality it was the sun. They were just looking for the sun, all of them together. They weren't coordinating in a typical way. And so each person in a crowd is making an individual decision um, to move from one part of the park to another. 
Um, and again, there's no protocol environment here. They just want to be in a warm place near people uh, to have a chat. So the sun is kind of uh, acting as a shepherd. And in the swarm environment, it's not the sun, it's actually the algorithm. Whatever is driving attention, right? You're kind of driving to that collective environment where the engagement is appropriate because the algorithm is kind of shepherd shepherding you into uh, a one way or another. Um, you might also say, okay, so they develop cell-like teams. Uh, so they're kind of like gorillas. Um, and in a, in, in a gorilla environment, uh, yeah, there are similar traits to swarm. So they create their own cell, cell like teams and they also use it, use the infrastructure, which they inhabited as communication and coordination. And that's really fascinating. So Jorge and, and, and Pablo and, and other people re refactored the social media tools that they had, which are used maybe for entertainment to be able to create a supply chain of aid to literally manage enterprise resources um, from one location to another. And so you're entering this space where the infrastructure itself becomes malleable to uh, the need that this type of swarm environment has. And so, you know, the one thing that all of these things have in common so, uh, and huge shout out to uh, Kia here for, for the concept of orientation that she'll do a presentation next year, is that all of these concepts, so animal swarms, crowds, uh, gorillas, actually have a shared orientation. Um, they're not using a specific protocol, but they have what Kia defines as a situational awareness that arranges kind of knowledge in a selective and associative manner towards a particular, particular direction. For the hurricane response, that was like, we need to get food and aid to specific people. They like they were literally going to die. My friends and family were, were in danger. And so that emergent promise that existed that we'll talk about in a second kind of aligns. It creates a North Star and you get people who were previously disparate into an energy level that allows them to take a direction. Um, the second thing that I that I re that I reference is they don't just have a direction, but they have a, a type of promise that people can interpret as they need to be able to take action. So while in a managerial situation, you might have a situation where people need to interpret what needs to get done, um, and the orientation needs to be directed towards something. This, this, this something, this interpretation is actually the promise. So John Robb, this is uh, from his book, Brave New War. Um, he talks about the promise as a central connection between all members in the guerrilla community. Each member has, specific, has different motivations. For me, it might be friends and family. For someone else, it might be a business. They might be very substantially different um, from uh, from others, like you might have people who are um, who have a negative valence or a positive valence on a situation, but they end up acting in concert. Um, for example, uh, for um, online, in the case of warfare, alternative motivations could be patriotism, hatred of occupation. It could be ethnic bigotry or religious fervor, but you end up coordinating and acting in a similar fashion at the same way. And swarms have that too. If you talk to one person in the swarm, they might tell you, oh, I'm doing it because of A. Talk to another one, you're doing it because of B. And yet, for some reason, they're coordinating. So very different motivations, but oriented kind of towards a similar promise that they're personally interpreting in different ways. Um, uh, this graph is actually what drove uh, me to this research. You might recognize it. Uh, the hurricane response is not the only storm by far. We'll go through a lot of different um, examples here. Uh, this one is actually uh, from Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and this is what triggered uh, the, the thought about this concept of like swarm action. In this case, a network of founders, investors and wealthy individuals ended up algorithmically coordinated trying to get their money out of a bank and accelerating the collapse of Silicon Valley back. They weren't necessarily responsible for it, but uh, essentially the, you know, Peter Thiel's founders fund sent a message and some other funds sent a message, hey, this bank might collapse and everybody ran to kind of save their money. 
And I'm sure some people also had some financial incentives to accelerate that process and get some shorts. And that's kind of another example of networked individuals, no protocol, no specific protocol, but end up coordinating and having real world tangible patterns and impact um, that we can see. Now, we've talked a little bit about how the fact that these are these swarms online are spectral. Um, they operate with some really specific uh, differences. First off, they navigate digital terrain, not physical ones. The second is location and mobilization are actually decoupled. So Jorge is in Berlin, Pablo is in New York. They're talking online, so they're decoupled. And third, um, swarms are require them to be networked. And I don't want to like downplay this too much. It's really, really critical because it, even in a crowd, you can't talk to everyone in the crowd. You can build a sign and try to get everybody to do it. You can shout. But in swarms, because you have instant communication with essentially everybody that's involved, you're broadcasting information and sending instant messages to each other. So you have this like really intertwined, entangled feedback loop, not just nearest neighbors communication. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, the, the swarms don't just account for people. They also account for content and bots. So they're kind of like tempests of information um, and people that are involved. So suddenly you have not just people coordinating, but someone's tweet can be misappropriated and believed to be part of the swarm, even if the person is not. But then that tweet might be like crawling the web and being pushed from one algorithm to another. And it creates a sense of potentially volume and entanglement. So you have content that's like flying with people and bots, which might be incentivized to take specific actions. And this will only accelerate as we have more autonomous um, objects that exist in, um, in virtual spaces. To illustrate this, by the way, um, to, to talk about some, of, some example swarms, uh, you might recognize this. This is the doubloon cat. Uh, you all get four doubloons. And um, back, I, I don't know if it was this summer or if it was last, it might have been this summer, last summer, last summer, um, an unknown number of people on TikTok, likely in the millions, started playing this game to collect imaginary coins. No one started this game. It just kind of like happened. Anybody could participate. Um, you just like browsed memes and videos and you would come across images like these and people would write down in the in their notepad on their phone, oh, I got plus four doubloons. I got minus 10 because I bought, I don't know, a glass of water, which a meme essentially shows the video say, hey, do you want a glass of water? It costs 10 doubloons. And they started writing down and suddenly you had millions of people who had notepads in their phone, not connected, no games, that were just like tallying up doubloons um, and playing the game together. And that's that's really fascinating. That's a type of emergent behavior uh, that is very different from a video game, which is a designed environment that people participate in. So we can kind of summarize this in, in this visual. So animals, which um, you have group of, uh, of animals forming patterns based on their ecosystem. You've got crowds, which have groups of people with a shared orientation. You have gorillas. And then what swarms, um, what swarms really do is that inside a networked and algorithmic ecosystem, that's where you get networked of people, content, and bots with a shared orientation. So you have this kind of like boundary condition, which you have a required amount of communication. Like th there's a boundary of how much communication needs to happen. And there's a boundary on the type of like algorithmic influence that also needs to happen. Um, and so you kind of get this like mass of content people and bots, which are getting um, uh, turned on, right, wound up by this algorithm that's seeking more engagement. And then you have the shared orientation and emergent promise that suddenly creates these movements, um, which is which is really exciting. But, you know, you, you take a step back and something that's important to note is that the these swarms are not a modern, not just a modern phenomenon. My suspicion, my suspicion, more research required, 
is that unprotocolized collective action in network environments is maybe the driver of a lot of manias that we thought were psychological components like in the previous environments. So there's like a lot of research here that we might want to do additionally, like the relationship between psychology and networked environments and, and tight communication. This image is from Outbreak, the Encyclo Encyclopedia of Extraordinary Social Behavior. And one of the ones which is, they, they have a lot of different stories here, uh, but one in particular is actually the tulip craze. And in, uh, they have this quote in this book, which is from Peter Garber, famous first bubbles. These tulip markets consisted of a collection of people without equity, making an ever increasing number of million dollar bets with one another, with some knowledge that the state would not enforce the contracts. So lack of consequence there, no protocol. This was no more than a meaningless winter drinking game played by a plague ridden population that made use of the vibrant tulip market. And this actually sounds really, really familiar. It sounds like what meme coins and a lot of the a lot of the movements that actually happen today are like, but they happen today in a matter of a day, not necessarily in a matter of a year, because the network communication is is much tighter. Um, so as we think about these uh, these patterns of behavior, um, you can take a step back and it really feels often like Tempest. And a lot of the organizations like Silicon Valley Bank feel like the ship that get entangled in this tempest and get rolled in. And, you know, as we were thinking about the hurricane response, the we can think about the life cycle of a swarm in actually similar term, terms. They're like what digital weather patterns um, and, you know, cause shipwrecks uh, about the same amount. If you're not careful, you might get entangled one and get canceled by the mob. And uh, the, the life cycle of these um, mimic actually quite closely, or uh, we can use this analogy or metaphor of a hurricane uh, life cycle to talk about a swarm uh, life cycle. Um, and this is exciting because we can do additional research here to start thinking about predictable life cycles. So what is warm waters that produce the right environments that a swarm might bubble up? Um, and the size of the swarm itself is fueled by natural feedback loops in their ecosystem that they live. In the, in the case of hurricanes, that feedback loop is kind of warm water, uh, warm waters and the moving air. But for swarms, um, the eager algorithms kind of amplify our actions to increase engagement. Um, so it's an inter interplay between the observer and the algorithmic um, uh, uh, the algorithmic engagement models that a social media or a networked environments have. And so we kind of simplify this to think about a swarm life cycle as an emergent process. So lots of, um, you know, shared orientations that get like funneled in to a specific direction. Then this acceleration process where the algorithm sees the swarm as an opportunity for whatever objectives that they have. And so you have this type of like wind up process of accelerating, 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 trying to get to this emergent promise um, that the swarm is aspiring towards. And then suddenly, if the energy collapses or the emergent promise is, is achieved, so it, it goes through this dissipation promise, uh, dissipation process where you have um, the orientation refragments. Um, and that's that's really cool. When when I started seeing this, suddenly when I'm online and we think about the current thing, you think about, oh, this is a lot of people finding similar contexts and finally kind of like a specific vision of the, what they would like to do. You see the algorithm winding them up and you say, OK, so how do I react to this? I can fuel the fire. I can add energy to it or I can also wait and let it dissipate. Um, so the, when Jorge and Pablo, uh, about two weeks after the hurricane dropped, they actually went back to Puerto Rico. Um, Jorge went to Puerto Rico to, to help. And what was kind of interesting is that the swarm had kind of um, dissipated. Um, so a few weeks after landfall, he was quite amazed because the local aid centers were actually fully staffed and they didn't 
need people for new volunteers. And in a way, the Swarm's promise had achieved and Jorge just stopped. He was like, oh, okay, now this is good. So the Facebook, you know, meeting chat, like just like stopped the, all these like artifacts remained as a trail of, of the, the Swarm itself. But new communities of support had solidified and attention shifted from Facebook messages to governmental aid programs and local networks. So Facebook and other media, what do you do? Well, the algorithm seeks a new source of engagement and actually stops winding you up as well. So the feedback loop that had wound you up in terms of the energy excitement unwinds you on the other side. And again, this is really a, this is really interesting because this is all happening without an intention protocol of organization. This is happening based on the interplay between the ecosystem and the participants of the ecosystem. Um, so, uh, so you know, the, there's a lot of different swarm experiences that uh, came up during the research. Um, you know, it was very obvious that swarms can vary very widely in terms of their impact, reach, the emotions that they evoke, so positive, negative valence. Uh, the collective behavior can create really distinct experiences. The six that kind of, uh, so there's still, again, more research to be done there. I don't, I don't, I'm not 100% sure of the taxonomy, but definitely at least six that showed up were like the trend, which is pop-up panics on Facebook, the current thing. The, often there's an action here that you're like signaling. You have games like the doubloon game. There's like scoring, role play, the ice bucket challenge. Um, there's like frenzies, which are more like grab and go. Uh, so there's risks, game losses here. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank um, falls into this. Like there's like a huge frenzy and like a specific activity that's done. There's a mobilization process. So this is more like the hurricane response where there's a creation process. In the case of the hurricane response, you had a supply chain that was created. But there's also raids, which are focused. It's kind of like a magnifying glass, and there's target, and there's accusations office. often. Twitter's main character of the day or cancellation campaigns are kind of fall in this, in this category. And finally, melees. So these are clashes. So there's debates, arguments, and you have these weird groups that end up arguing with each other. A lot of forum confrontations like happen here. Um, one another example of a swarm was actually this summer. The uh, did did the rock float? Uh, I think it didn't um, at the end of it. But this was super fascinating. This paper came out, and scientists from all over the world said, "We need to see if this is real." In a traditional, yeah, the rock doesn't float. In a traditional environment, this paper would have gone through peer review. Someone would, you know, some institutions would have tried to imitate it. But in this case, we had random researchers from Russia and like independent, like, you know, labs in their basements and corporations uh, doing 72 hour, you know, uh, hackathons to try to figure out if they could recreate the flop, the, the, the rock floating um, to various degrees of success. But uh, eventually it was found that that it didn't. But imagine the amount of focus, the brain power that came from all around the world to focus on this one problem for a period of four or five days. Or um, it, it was, I, I guess it extended a little bit into a week, but really, really incredible, the mind share at a global level that came up. Um, now, we talked a lot about people. So doubloons, having people, uh, we talked about uh, um, the rock, the scientists, hurricane response, but not all swarms have people. And this is, again, another research thread here, which is if you have autonomous pieces of content, software and AI agents, um, what do swarms look like when there is actually no people involved? And we don't have to go too far to actually understand what this looks like. Um, this graph is also very interesting. See if you can um, guess what this is. Uh, but this was back in May 2010, and this was the flash crash. And in the flash crash, uh, where the market kind of like went down, the, the no people were involved. This was a bunch of algorithms that got triggered in succession uh, to sell a bunch of stocks um, uh, back to back. 
And people had to intervene to essentially stop the bots from this like uh, vicious cycle uh, because they were confused about how they should react to specific market movements. And so as we get more autonomous agents, I would suspect that we're going to see a lot of very surprising um, events, uh, more black swans, one might say, or, or I guess because we're talking about it, maybe not so much black swans, um, that some of them we might see, but some of them we might not realize for years that they actually happened. Um, and that's going to be that that's going to be really interesting on how you how you behave in a digital world where this is happening. It's really like a bit of a dark forest out there uh, when we think about um, the the fact that we don't know how extensive these swarms and um, coupled uh, relationships actually exist, and the fact that we're in a more um, a more uh, um, interconnected space. Now, I do want to say so. Even extending this further, um, even if you don't have people, something that's kind of interesting is that swarms leave a blueprint. Um, online, when you create a connection, when I follow someone, if I forget I follow that person, that network still exists. Jorge and Pablo in the hurricane response are still friends. That spreadsheet still exists. Those Facebook groups still exist. And what that means is that there's, there's this type of ghost of swarms which persist even after the swarm dissipates. So the swarm might dissipate from a life cycle perspective, but you have a kind of afterlife. And that means that the algorithm has also learned that this pattern exists. So when the next hurricane comes around, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, algorithms willing, I guess, a similar network gets activated and the same artifacts get repurposed and another, and the swarm maybe comes alive uh, again. Um, because honestly, they, you know, these patterns just inhabit the, the entire stack um, of what's actually happening online. Um, they crisscross, you know, the various layers of, of the internet. Uh, this is a, an image from Maggie Appel, uh, Appleton um, that was talking about the social media landscape. Um, now, if swarms exist, the next question is, wait, what other um, exactly, yeah, so uh, there's a dark side of this, which has to do with persistent, like, uh, post-traumatic connection, the, the, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's kind of stressors. Yeah, the, we might think them as stressors as a kind of collective hive mind PTSD potentially. They get re, re, reactivated. Um, so the, the question that comes up, okay, so if swarms exist, within what context do they exist? Because swarms are very likely, if they are a type of creature or a species that exists online, who else exists? Um, so, uh, during the research, um, while, you know, trying to figure out what swarms are and what they are not, it was kind of interesting because I kept on coming across other archetypes. Um, one of them is from Peter Lindbergh called a uh, mimetic tribe. And this one, uh, is characterized by the creation and maintenance of cultural assets. So swarms don't have cultural assets. They don't have a name, right? The hurricane response doesn't have like a name. Um, the but they they can adopt a name and then might adopt colors and a flag and slogans. And so these cultural assets then kind of it can it can create a different type of archetype. So the mimetic tribe. Um, so the the next one that I came across. Uh, was actually what I call digital farms. So his, historically, um, we've seen gold farming in World of Warcraft and a lot of gaming. We now see airdrop farming in crypto environments. And they're kind of similar to swarms because they kind of do swarm-like actions. But unlike a swarm, they're actually focused on kind of like extracting a specific piece of value from the, e from the ecosystem that they see, it's kind of like a hack. And they have a distinct playbook. So they so um, swarms don't really have a protocol of how to behave, but farms do. They have like task lists. 
do this, optimize this. This is the fastest way that you can get gold. Um, now, farms do exist in dubious legal spaces, um, and uh, they they do try to not adopt any type of names or structure because they're also like there are arbitrage opportunities. So they want to like make sure to skirt the law and the terms and conditions um, that they might inhabit. Um, other types of farms, you follow me and I follow you. Um, so we both look like influencers. Um, there's uh, there's all sorts of all sorts of stuff here. Um, and then the the other one that kind of like uh, that came up is uh, is these online communities of which fandoms I consider a subtype. Uh, these have cultural assets, but one of the things that they have is a locality that spans both the virtual and physical worlds of their users. And that locality is not just a mind space, it's actually a gathering spot. They have events. A swarm doesn't have an event, you know. Um, mimetic tribes may have some things that they do, but communities have official canon um, is, is the, the core differentiator here. And these online communities um, the, are, are quite common. You have the Swifties, BTS Army, and uh, a bunch of them. At the end of the day, they do have um, a home. Now, the last one, if uh, you might imagine, I work in DAOs, this, if you don't recognize it, is actually an example of uh, the MakerDAO protocol. Might be a bit um, outdated so far. And this is super complicated. So this, like communities, they do have a home. Um, they do have cultural assets. But the thing that really differentiates them is they have encoded protocols. So here, instead of relying on the ecosystem, the DAO can exist in any ecosystem because they can move their protocol and encode it um, wherever there's facilities to be a, to, to have that. So they're, they're much more autonomous um, and independent. So the internal infrastructure for the maker protocol allows virtual organizations to exist across platforms instead of inside of them. Um, these benefits, though, have their own costs because launching and maintaining kind of like the software encoded social protocol can be like quite expensive, also risky. You can get hacked. Um, and it requires a bit of a team of engineers to translate the social protocols that you that you want um, into actual like useful code. Um, not that easy to do. Um, so. Uh, the the landscape that kind of like emerged from the research is that <clears throat> swarms use external algorithms uh, for coordination, so they are based on the terrain. Mimetic tribes coordinate by cultural assets and distribution. Farms actually have tactical playbooks. Online communities have canon and a digital home. And virtual organizations are actually creating social uh, software contracts with them. Um, and all of these, again, these are digital entities. Uh, we aren't, I, I would say, I would argue, we don't know 100% what this might look like yet in real world institutions, um, but it does seem like the like these online entities are uh, the natural evolution of what happens when you have a non-network world getting essentially upgraded into hyper-communication and hyper-connection um, which we're in right now. If we had the founding fathers creating a new nation today, it might look quite different. It might look much more like a virtual organization and a protocol design, um, not so much a, a law document. Um, so the so now now what we can think about here, and uh, again more research to be done, is that there's a rough there's a rough distribution here. Um, and we can debate the term protocolized in a, in, in a hot second, but it seems like there's like less protocols or less explicit social protocols on one side of this, and then more explicit or encoded protocols on the other side. So whereas swarms enforce um, are enforced by behavior, by social behavior, um, and facilitated by the algorithm, on the other hand, virtual organizations are actually enforced by the infrastructure that they themselves uh, create, um, which is quite cool. Now, uh, if we if we think about this transition, 
and we think about these different um, environments, the we can also start thinking about transitions. So when does a swarm become a mimetic tribe? When does a mimetic tribe, how does it evolve into an online community? Can a virtual organization dissolve into swarms or dissolve into mimetic tribes? And um, I, I think at least one directional uh, development of this is quite obvious. So swarms do tend to, uh, a fa a factions as Rene uh, Duresra has mentioned, do sometimes persist as they create cultural assets. So uh, here we have Michael Saylor, you have, you start seeing here, you know, uh, the lightning bolt for the Bitcoin lightning network, Bitcoin, you know, obviously Bitcoin is not really a swarm of cryptographers. Um, it's actually a mimetic tribe here. And not only that, but because you have transitions, but you also have manipulation. Um, I think the a lot of public and private institutions already intuitively understand that these entities exist online. They might call them networks of influence. They might call them other things. I call them swarms or mimetic tribes. And you can actually influence them because you can embed, you can change the algorithm, you can embed content, and then you can also embed messaging to influence them. Um, there's a reason why brands are partnering with TikTok influencers after all, right? Um, what does that influence look like? Well, it's in infiltrating mimetic tribes. It's infiltrating virtual organizations and communities. It's uh, summoning a swarm uh, to your benefit. Now, on the other hand, as people try to influence them, um, there's different types of, uh, the, of influence um, that you can have um, with regards to, um, to swarms. Um, so uh, what, I think big social media platforms have already illustrated um, a first attempt at controlling swarm-like behavior. Um, you have uh, global content moderation uh, programs, you have international KYC protocols, um, and you have a, a lot of different tools that um, that are essentially trying to control the valence of swarms and try to also contain the negative impact of this type of like spreading information and, and orientation, right? You don't want a swarm of depressed teenagers, even though we've kind of gotten to that point. And so the I would say the tools are kind of like emerging. We know some of them work, but the effectiveness is still a little bit elusive. Um, we know that even the tools that we develop can have quite severe consequences for the people who involve them themselves. Um, now, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, these tools are getting more and more sophisticated. Facebook, for example, um, not just started moderating content, but they also started moderating uh, networks. Um, and this is a, a part of uh, the dangerous organizations and individuals by category. So in this case, Facebook is not just moderating if content is appropriate, they're also now moderating the network with which you're associated with. If you're associated with a criminal network, um, or uh, terrorism, you will also uh, potentially be silenced um, or shadow banned or even removed uh, from the platform. And all of these, um, I think I refactored them or I changed, I, I like the name that they're alignment technologies. And this kind of rhymes with what's happening with AI. We might even say that these networks, these swarms, virtual organizations, might be representative of uh, super intelligence as Bostrom kind of like defined them because, and, and we're trying to create um, a technologies that align, you know, these organizations to kind of like move towards one direction or another one. Kind of like um, as magnets here, uh, you know, trying to, to move towards an orientation. Now, one of the things that came out though, is that a lot of these alignment technologies today are, quite focused on assimilation. So they align networks of people, content, and bots towards the objective of a central entity. So this means you swarms are fine as long as I can place ads. You know, swarms are fine as long as, you know, XYZ, Facebook's OKRs or Google's OKRs. 
And they're kind of like shepherds in a way. So they change the algorithm, you do the moderation. Um, so you're shepherding this group. And so a question came up, okay, wait, um, is there a different type of alignment technology that we should be considering here that's less about organizing people towards the objective of a central entity and more about um, enabling the swarm to find the path themselves towards their own, towards their own um, uh, promises. And so the, and so they were all, exactly, yeah. So as Kia said, there's a quip that a skilled parent um, doesn't try to intervene in a kid's argument. Uh, instead, they roll down the windows to let in more air. So the question of what happens if we're foresters um, instead of shepherds? And uh, we've been talking about shepherding and service-based leadership for a long time. And maybe now it's time to think about forestry. Had to tip to Timber for um, talking to me about forestry a while back. And these technologies are quite exciting because um, the actually there's examples of them today. So once I thought about that, I was like, ah, that's what community notes is. Community notes is doesn't necessarily align people to the objectives of the central entity, but it helps clarify the context of the situation so that um, the the swarm that evolves or the the communication is clear between the participants. And um, I'd really recommend um, reading this article by Yonden uh, Fu, who uh, is a co-founder of LivePeer. Um, so they wrote this article under the hood on community notes, and the model is encouraged to, to um, represent notes likelihood to be rated helpful um, by a broad set of users with diverse viewpoints. They're not actually trying to be truthful, which is very interesting here. They're not trying to be factual. They're trying to be helpful. So, and this is very interesting. You know, I think about them as attunement technologies. Uh, where you're shaping the network structure and orientation to best achieve the goals uh, that the network has in mind. Moral debates, uh, very interesting, another piece of research there, but exploring what these types of new types of attunement technology might look like, not just assimilation towards a specific environment, um, can be quite can be quite interesting. And in you know, in that case, we might end up creating a different type of forest, maybe not so dark. <laughs> To begin with, uh, but uh, time will tell. Um, you know, I think it's worthwhile to take a step back. There's been plenty of books written over the over the last century about the power of crowds. Um, uh, the they've been civil rights movements. Um, they've been a poor component of democratic participation in in a lot of countries for a while. And now the question comes up. You know, what does it look like when we're hyper-connected and it's not just physical crowds, which have their own affordances and powers, but now we have a new player in the game, um, a series of online entities of formations and swarms uh, that participate together and unlock a, another scale of coordination and impact. And hopefully, if we're lucky, this might actually be part of the answer to solving some of the bigger problems that we have uh, at, a, at, a, at a world, at a global level, um, that are simply not possible uh, to solve with uh, just um, nearest neighbor uh, communication. So thank you so much uh, for everyone. Um, really uh, glad you, I had the opportunity to do this. Um, and a big thank you to, to a lot of people who are written here. Um, so soon, by the way, I'll be joining a DAO because I wanna put these ideas in practice. Um, and then I would also recommend um, taking a look at the different artifacts um, where we did a fictional, fictional product and we also developed a bit of a workshop. Venkat? Right. So uh, I've been thinking lately a lot about Josh Turk's uh, concept of hardness in his uh, Adams Institution's blockchains essay. And since your uh, project is one of those that kind of like started off with like one of the protocols of swarms and then landed on, well, swarms are the unprotocolized parts. Uh, the question is, where is the hardness in swarm dynamics? What are the Adams? I, I think the hardness lies in the terrain. 
Um, so there's there's two like the I I think we can we can go back to kind of like animal swarms like where does hardness and ants live? So hardness and ants live <clears throat> genetic predispositions and pheromones right that they use. So the traces of connection. So how communication happens is one of the atoms. You change how the communication happens. You change the swarm dynamic. You change the terrain. You change the swarm outcome. So I would say that those are the two primary areas where um, where the hardness lies in the nature of the part of the agents themselves, how they communicate, and then the terrain that they're actually navigating. That's why I think TikTok swarms probably have a different affordance uh, group than uh, Twitter swarms, different media, different uh, network of coordination. Uh, Dorian? Yeah, you just got me thinking about like the design of affordances in general in um, like, uh, you know, like Don Norman kind of stuff, like uh, uh, design of everyday things and uh, things that yeah. make us smart, sort of a co cognitive artifacts, representational artifacts, that kind of thing. And then so then it becomes a question of, yeah, like, so how do you design you know, swarm affordances and artifacts that are that, that cause or 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 uh, contribute to swarms. Um, what in, yeah, yeah. And so I don't know, like, how, I mean, I um, I I haven't I haven't like completely gone through your stuff yet. Um, you are you you're the one of the first ones, aren't you? That gets released. Um, no, no, mine is in March. Mine is in March, but I can send you the essay. You can read it. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Um. So uh, first off, Timber, I think you're right. I think the emergence of a shared promise gives hardness. But one of the things that I think hardness is is also something you can control. I have difficulty, based on the research, to have found a way to control the promise effectively. But controlling the terrain and the communication pathway is actually quite a hard thing that you can manipulate. You can change the algorithm, right? You can change whether who can message who. But the promise itself at least based on the conversations that I've had and experiences, seems like a very difficult um, thing to like wrap your head, wrap your hand around. Uh, Dorian, for your question, during the research, um, I also looked at crowd control mechanics and what um, can turn a crowd into a stampede, for example. And one of the things that they talked about is like, we actually quite have a lot of technology that's not necessarily obvious, <laughs> But having bathrooms, having fans, not having the crowd get too warmed up, having plenty of exits, having a locus of attention, all of these are kind of like things that, um, that we do for crowd control. And we'll likely see, I, I suspect, and also by the way, crowd barriers and also threats of violence also used for crowd control. My suspicion is that um, there's no such thing as a digital gun just yet, but I suspect that there's going to be a lot more um, adversarial design, not just to incentivize swarm development, but also to dampen or to dissipate them as quickly as possible. Um, I think this is kind of like inevitable. And uh, like you said, it feels like a, an interesting design space um, that hasn't necessarily been explored. Yeah, and you also just got me thinking of the uh, locusts. Uh, uh, don't if they get too warm too, don't they? Uh, don't they get? Is that what turns a grasshopper into a locust? Is the is is if they get too hot? Yeah, and and that brings in kind of like if you think about an analogy between global warming and digital world warming, you can also think about like online trends which are warming the water and creating more swarms. And what cools the water, what maintains a right like uh, balance between participation versus this kind of like stampede or wind up process. Yeah. Well, in the chat, I put in, uh, made me think of Gamergate and other sort of harassment campaigns where there was an obvious, if unsavory thing to do. And, and so it's like, well, I can do that. And then people uh, did it kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chanel? 
Yes. Um, I have, I was also intrigued by the idea of a promise guiding swarms, which I know you recently said was um, a difficult question. Um, I'm curious if there's um, stronger or weaker promises behind different swarms and I guess how the varieties of different promises work. Like for example, I mean, is the promise guiding a group of guerrilla fighters stronger than the one guiding an online community. I mean, maybe not if the online community is guided by a deep sense of personal identity. Yeah. So uh, as you were describing that, the thing that popped into my mind is that a strong enough promise actually creates a world imaginary. So like the idea of monarchy and actually like the idea of democracy is a strong enough promise we can all participate. And so I do think, as you said, there are varying levels and the strength of the promise, um, like that shared orientation, I think has a lot of like, you know, contextual pieces. Like there, I think there might be a lot of luck involved in that process. Um, I think at a macro level, when we see um, um, like, a, like, like the internet has enabled a new type of promises to potentially exist. Um, and I think there's, there's not just different um there's not just different uh like hardness in terms of the promises or like capability of promises i also think there's a horizon of imagination so certain promises only exist within specific world environments um and that type of it, it makes me wonder you know the fact that Swarms might be indicative of new types of promises that people might coordinate around and actually create protocols to actually, um, uh, you know, create new things and uh, um, and produce additional value in new organizations or industries. In. Interesting. Thank you. Yes, swords are what, yeah, they're the opposite, the swords are in many ways the opposite of the truth. If you stop believing in it, it goes away. <laughs> yeah, that's a great comment, Kia. But the, yeah, they often do become, become something else. Cool. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining. If you have other questions, like feel free to send me a note. Uh, I am now working to build a DAO and to put a, a lot of this algorithmic coordination into practice and seeing how we can produce good in the world um, with that. So that's the plan. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rafa. Any last minute questions or comments? Uh, just a quick note that um, if any of you is interested in uh, developing a consulting offering out of your research, stay on for about 10 minutes on this call after the live stream ends. I'd like to brainstorm it a bit. Awesome. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Tim, if you want to stop the stream and we can transition to that uh, portion of this meeting.